here goes. I click over here. I go to more. I press record. So I've got a little introduction and then we over to go over to David. Welcome everybody to a webinar with David Shanks, preparing for your NQT year. It's Wednesday, the 27th of May, 2020. My name is Helen Myers. My Twitter handle is at Helen Myers, and I'm the chair of the London branch of the Association for Language Learning. I'm also a member of the management board of the association, and I had a lovely, lovely period when I was the past, when I was the president um, about 10 years ago, and I loved it. We also have in the room, Joe Dale, um, you'll have seen him, I'm sure. You can see his face at the moment. Joe, do you want to introduce yourself? Yes. Hi, everyone. So uh, I'm uh, Joe Dell on Twitter. I'm, uh, according to The Guardian, the man behind the MFL Twitterati. So if you haven't heard of the MFL Twitterati, it's a community of language teachers and consultants and associations. Uh, there's 5,000 members. And if you just check out the hashtag MFL Twitterati every day for 10 minutes, you're bound to pick up a, a gem every single time that you do that. Um, I'm also available for any sort of tech support. If you want to send many messages on Twitter, um, feel free to do so. I'm more than happy to help. In fact, I've just put uh, a link in the chat for you, which is a 38 page document all about remote teaching ideas, which should keep you busy as well. Okay, so thanks ever so much to Joe. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have already met, met him before or have heard of him. Your trainers definitely will have told you about Joe. Thank you. Um, and I always mention Heike Filk, who's Heike Filk. Um, who's helped us an awful lot in working out how to do these things online. She's a real whiz, whiz on this sort of thing. Later on, um, David's going to talk a lot about the association and encouraging you to join. Um, so just, just make sure that um, by the end of this, definitely you will have joined AWL. Um, and I'm sure that for people to write in the chat, normally people do say, I'm a member of AWL as well. Um, this uh, webinar is going to be available on our webinar site. We're up to 63 webinars now, so that if you're looking for any extra training, you could look on that site and find some others, other things which will help you perhaps. Coming soon, um, and this is part of a TILT, that's Technology in Language Teaching. Um, Joe Dale and I have been working together on putting together, well, Joe has been doing most of the scouting for absolutely amazing people who come along and give us advice on online teaching. And I've been you know, doing pretty little things in the background. I've been doing web pages and this sort of thing. We've got a fantastic programme of um, things for you. And next uh, Tuesday, for example, June the 2nd, Carmen's going to come and speak to us um, about languages. This is to not to be missed, a webinar with Stephen Fawkes. Um, that's um, on June the 4th. And we have our own AWL London event, which is coming up on June the 20th. Again, I think that David's going to be talking a little bit more about the opportunities available in AWL. We have an etiquette about being professional and kind. And for the benefit of the recording, just to say AWL London, London is very happy to host speakers and participants free of charge. Speakers and participants are responsible for what they say. But this is who you've come to see, and that is David Shanks, lead MFL consultant for the Harris Federation, and importantly for this in, particularly, in particular, a member of AWL Council. We have got superb people who are part of this association, and it's particularly good that he's part of the London branch as well, from my point of view. And really somebody who is obviously very involved with his own organization, but really encapsulates the spirit we feel of AWL, of people looking out and helping other people. We're really a big family. So over to you, David, I'm now going to stop my video and uh, stop sharing my screen so that you can take over. Stop share. Lovely, thank you, Helen, for the kind words. And to Joe as well, I think I should start by thanking both Joe Dale and Helen Myers on behalf of the languages community for all, all the amazing things they've been putting together and um, keeping us up to date with all the latest in their Tilt Thursdays and all the CPD that's there on offer. So a big thank you on behalf of all languages teachers in the UK and beyond uh, to Helen and Joe. Hopefully now you can see my screen okay. I'm just going to get things set up my end. So it'd be great if you could start by just saying. In the yes, we can. Lovely. So I'm going to start and I'm going to try and model a little bit 
some ideas for online learning. One thing is you want to keep your uh, audience engaged a little bit. So straight off the bat, you've got a question from me in the Zoom chat window. Could you answer the question? And that is, what's your number one piece of advice or the top tip that you've taken from your MFL training year? And could I ask you to prefix that with A1 colon? That stands for answer one. And then what we'll be able to do is to compile all the expertise in the room, all the learning, and I look forward to seeing a few ideas come in. Don't reinvent the wheel, be organized, et cetera, et cetera. Lovely. So whilst your ideas are coming in and we crowdsource those, uh, just a brief introduction. As Helen mentioned, my name is David Shanks. I work in London as a consultant across uh, the Harris Federation schools. I oversee languages generally there, um, but mostly I work with the 26 secondary schools. I'm also a member of the AWL Council and London branch committee and for the past year and a bit I've been working for NSELP, the National Centre for Excellence for Language Pedagogy. You can find me on Twitter at HF Languages and you have there to the Oxford University Press blog where I've written a few blog posts that might be useful. So without further ado let's get cracking. Uh, in tonight's webinar I'm going to start off by going through some AWL freebies and some words on membership and why it's a really good idea to join. Then we're going to take a bit of a step back and try and remember the context and the why of modern foreign languages teaching. And following that, we'll look at jobs in particular, some ideas uh, for online interview preparation. Again, we might draw on the expertise in the room for that. Certainly when you were signing up, lots of people had questions. You had the opportunity to ask questions in advance. And I should mention that actually this is a, an annual webinar I've run for two or three years now and certainly this year there's some very special circumstances in light of the unprecedented circumstances we find ourselves in. Then we'll look at how you might prepare for your NQT year before it starts, that's to say this term and over the summer, and then the NQT year itself, some ideas that I've um, taken from working with lots of NQTs and things I've discovered, and then I'm going to wrap up with some of my top tips for teaching and learning in MFL and then some top tips in general. And at that point, if time still allows, we'll pop um, onto some Q and A's. I have a few compiled from the questions that came in when you were subscribing, but also happy to take them in the chat box. So again, as another way to keep you involved, I'd ask you all to have a pen and paper to hand. I'm quoting a 2014 research article here. The pen is mightier than the keyboard. So rather than thinking, oh, can I get my hands on those slides? It will actually be better for your learning if you're writing stuff down on a good old fashioned piece of paper and a pen, it helps you to synthesize your ideas. So hopefully your pens are at the ready. And onto the freebies. First freebie I'd like to make you aware of is an AWL NQT publication. In order to access that, all you need to do is to send an email saying you would like to access it to info at AWL dash languages dot org dot uk it's a really useful document to dip into it's got some nice overarching advice and um, you can see there nqt it talks a lot about nurturing yourself and uh, building quality connections and growing as an M mfl teacher in a similar vein uh, we say thank you for the next to the, on the next freebie to linguoscope and also the awl london branch who've compiled this little 12 page booklet full of tips and ideas for trainee language teachers and I'll let you peruse the bullet point lists, but lots of useful things there. The first bullet point, something I feel very strongly about, many ways of using a single resource. We'll come on to that later, but the idea of recycling a particular resource, um, being efficient with your time, we've already seen in the chat today, don't reinvent the wheel. So if you do go off and source a nice text or a nice video or a nice um, piece of audio, then make sure you're squeezing all the learning juice you can out of it. Um, so a nice useful document there and you have the link down below. You can access that on Linguoscope's um, website. For me, one of the main advantages of joining AWL is Languages Today. It's uh, a languages publication written by MFL teachers for MFL teachers and it, it is international and there's lots of contributions from around the world, but lots of the teachers who do contribute are in the UK, so it's very relevant to our context. Um, and for the first time, um, I believe this has been made, made available digitally, the May edition, so the summer edition, it's free to download now. And there you have the front cover and the kind of thing that you can expect 
in this due are people talking about their plan for online teaching, which is very relevant to today, how you might get students online and engaged. Again, very relevant indeed. And also there's always reference to resources. Textivate, a really useful tool that I've been familiar with for a long time. And if you see there, teaching literature in the A-level modern languages classroom, that's on to read list it has arrived. And I've heard very, very good um, reviews of that book. It's great to hear that Celeste has downloaded uh, language is today and find it so full of ideas. It may well be that with your school experience cut short, perhaps um, that A level is something you haven't had too much of a chance to dip into. So it's nice to see that languages today is, is supporting your development by signposting you to useful resources and that A level modern languages classroom is a book I'd recommend. Um, so there you have the link. This edition of languages today can be accessed on a page that, compile, that compiles lots of home learning help. So AWL has been really proactive in sourcing and pulling together lots of different pieces that are useful for online teaching and you can access those all at that link. So at this juncture, again, over to you. This is an opportunity. Could you let us know if you as a soon to be NQT would be interested in contributing to the September edition of Languages Today? I've had a request from Stephen Fox to ask the attendees this evening because Autumn will see a bit of a focus on NQTs and also include a feature a day in the life of an NQT. So if you fancy um, seeing your name up in Languages Today and authoring an article, it would be really great. So if you could and are interested in that, um, please do let us know and prefix that with A2 colon so that whenever we get in touch with Stephen afterwards, we can let him know, yes, person X would love to contribute to the website or indeed to languages today. I'm going to go very quickly um, through this slide, but just some of the top reasons to join AWL. It keeps you up to date. The weekly e-bulletin, all net, really, really useful. It keeps you in touch through the branches as we are now with webinars, but also face-to-face, -face, regional, national, and local level. Should you be plugging some subject knowledge gaps or trying to evidence your teacher standards, uh, membership of a professional association is an excellent way to do that. And also through reading the teacher briefings that AWL produce, that means you will be up to date and in the loop on all developments and policy changes in the MFL landscape. So really useful in that respect. We've got high quality CPD, both online face-to-face -face and at Language World. You can also connect with research. That's something more recently in my career that I've been really enjoying getting to grips with, undertaking a master's recently. Um, and also importantly, make your voice heard. So when policies are changing or new specifications and curricula, uh, AWL is a way for you to have your opinions and voice heard. You can also access resources directly. And another thing is you can, of course, save money because you have a reduction in resources and also in attendance at CPD. So as you're attending, I just want to make you aware that you can, if you're not already a member of AWL, uh, you can get a 10% discount, which is in addition to the heavily discounted student and NQT membership. At this moment, it would be great to hear in the chat window, let us know if you're already an AWL member or if you would like to become one. I'll give you a few seconds. I know a few people are already. And I'll let you scan down all the benefits there. Some of them I've mentioned already. For me, the highlights would be the Languages Today magazine. And latterly then, I've been looking into research, then the Language Learning Journal online. And then lots and lots of CPD events. So great to hear lots of people are PTC members and some people might hopefully be signing up very, very soon. So that's the AWL membership and some freebies. I'd like now just to take a bit of a step back and, and ask you to ask yourself, why do you teach MFL? Let that sink in. I've got a little quote here. Learning a foreign language is the liberation from insularity. I really like that line, liberation from insularity and provides an opening to other cultures. Any brownie, some brownie points will be available for anyone who knows where this line comes from. Does anybody know? It is indeed the national curriculum, so well done you. You should all be familiar with that. This is what you'll be teaching. And another little quote that I'll let you read through. It's from Eric Hawkins. This idea of challenging parochialism, I think really important if we think of 
a seemingly increasingly polarized world. Um, then I think the, the idea of liberation from insularity and challenging parochialism are some really big picture things that, that we need to sometimes take stock of before we get bogged down in the day to day of, of our, our starters and teaching a particular language or grammar structure. As MFL teachers, I think it's important as well that we, we sell languages. Hopefully you can see a, re a really lovely infographic here um, that I've always had on my door uh, of every classroom I've taught in. Um, just a really nice visual way of outlining why we should learn languages. That's a, a useful little tip if you're ever searching for resources, find out the, the word for infographic in the language you teach. For me, if I type a certain topic followed by infographie, then I know I'm going to get some pretty striking materials and interesting stats and graphs that can often be used as starters. And then just thinking about the more recent context, so the English Baccalaureate, uh, the government now has a target that by 2022, 75% of students should be studying the EBAC, which of course includes uh, modern foreign language. Ofsted's new framework of inspection as well has a real focus on curriculum, and I'm aware of working with my schools that actually suddenly subject has become important again, whereas previously it was data, data, data. Neither be I'm, I'm aware of many more conversations going on about, well, how do you teach languages? How do you sequence the content? How would you approach this grammar point? And I think that's a really healthy thing. The government has also funded uh, the National Centre for Excellence for Language Pedagogy. And if you can just about make out the graph, you'll see the grey line, that's national uptake, which is unfortunately since 2012 roughly plateaued around about the 50% mark, but there are pockets and overlaid that you can see at Harris Federation, we're really happy. In 2011, we had just 24% of students taking a language, which is pretty miserable when I think about it. And now we're happy to say that around 66% of our students are taking a language and there is good backing at a senior leadership level. So. That's just to kind of take a bit of a step back and look at the context and try and remind us why we're learning languages and hopefully convey that passion to students. Super quick tour then of my own context. I did things a little bit back to front in that I taught for two years abroad uh, in France and then subsequently in Norway. And so I was teaching before I actually did my training in London at the IOE. And I actually went moved from an international school in Norway context to inner city London. So. I think I, I raise that to, to help to try and draw attention to the fact that context is really, really key. And even within the same country and the same area, school contexts are really, really different and very hugely. And you need to be prepared to, to be flexible. I think it's really important. Uh, I had to work quite a lot on getting the classroom right and actually on picking a lot of bad habits. It's been shown that unfortunately a lot of how we teach and uh, we probably base it on how we were taught. So yeah, I learned a language this way, that works for me. So that's what I'm going to relay. So my worst habit, I would often ask um, rhetorical questions. Why are you talking? If you want a really snappy piece of behavior management, I'd say avoid rhetorical questions or why are you chewing chewing gum? You're inviting, um, you're inviting um, deliberation over that point. So on picking bad habits um, is something really important. For me, whenever I had taught for a while and then was doing my PGC, I found it quite hard to reconcile the theory. So I would be learning about the zone of proximal development. And then I was working in a really tough um, school with year nine on a Friday afternoon and, and kind of marrying these two was uh, a little bit of a challenge. And I think I grew frustrated at the time. Um, but in retrospect, I think it's important to see where the ends are for research. And certainly in the last five years, there's been a huge shift, I would say. You've got many um, more Kind of conduits of research into education movements like research education lots of cognitive science has become quite in vogue and is coming into schools in more digestible formats so i think do do see how the theory can marry up with your practice even if it's not always immediately apparent another thing i learned was that rumor is not reality i went into um, my initial nqt school quite fearful i heard that i was going to be observed and really heavily scrutinized and and that turned out not to be the case at all. I, I was surrounded by today, what has been the best languages department, really supportive colleagues, the most inspiring head of department, and a couple of other NQTs who started around the same time with him. I'm still a good friend and we still um, keep in touch on all things MFL. So I would just be, be aware of rumors and that they're not always the reality. 
over time, I've come to realize the importance of outside networks. If there's one thing I, I wish I'd done more of in my early MFL career, it would be interacting with outside networks like AWL. So if you're here already, you're one step better than I was as an NQT. Um, so well done there. And Joe's already uh, mentioned the MFL Twitterati. Something as well that I wasn't perhaps aware of because I was so focused on just getting the teaching right was that there's huge scope for progression and following your interests within uh, MFL. So I quite early after being an NQT started to mentor other teachers and really got into the teaching and learning side of things and subsequently have done a master's and worked in, uh, I currently work in initial teacher education, which is really, really interesting and stimulating because always full of fresh ideas. So there are many different um, kind of areas for career development and I'll touch on some of those later. And also this notion of lifelong learning, I think it's thrown around, but your PLN, your personal learning network, it's really, really important. Um, so what is your own personal learning network? Sometimes it's useful to pause and take stock, well, where am I getting my ideas from? And maybe you might want to cast the net a bit wider or look to different organizations or different resources. Um, for me, having a really healthy approach towards your own continued professional developments, it's critical. It keeps things fresh and interesting for you. Um, AWL provide that, lastly a master's for me and a lot of the work that I'm doing with the National Centre at the minute is, is really eye-opening and challenges my thinking so I find that really healthy. And above all just having a real satisfaction, there's, there's an underlying moral cause that we can you know sleep easy at night and we might not run out of school on a, on a Friday afternoon and you know high-fiving one another but if you're ever looking for some inspiration look at those couple of clips so taylor malley or rita pearson on ted talks really really good and inspiring stuff for you know teaching is a fantastic job and the best job in the world so on to the nitty-gritty and some of the questions i was asked so talking about applying for jobs first thing you might ask is where so obviously you've got the the tes the times educational supplement uh, the guardian there's also a very good facebook group mfl teaching posts which is run by the same people who run mfl secondary or secondary mfl matters and um, so that's really useful should you be on the lookout for a job currently and then also school groups i've linked there for example a direct link to the harris career site where you've got groups of schools that are working together in trusts or federations then more and more increasingly commonly you've got um, um job adverts uh, on their bespoke websites so it's always, the earlier you apply the better but don't if you haven't yet secured a job don't panic mfl is very much in demand i was checking our website just the other day and there's at least four jobs have come up very recently because just before half term is the moment at which some teachers may hand in their resignation letters so coming up to the may half term is always a really good time and you might notice a flurry of um, activity with adverts coming out and there's still plenty of time um, one thing to be aware of that, that's new, and we were discussing this in the AWL London Committee, is that you may see there are a lot more one-year contracts being offered, or perhaps extended probation periods. That, it seems, would be normal for the circumstance, so don't, don't panic if you're offered a one-year contract. It's not necessarily a reflection of you, it's more a reflection of the times and that schools aren't able to interview in as detailed uh, a format as they might usually, so just be aware that that, that could be the new norm. It's really important you pick the right fit of school, but I think for your first school as well, you, you need to be willing to, to compromise. Um, so you already may have a fairly firm idea of what the type of education establishment is that you want to work in, um, but you may have to, to compromise or you might have to look at a slightly longer commute or these things, um, particularly for your first post. Remember that you're still learning as we all are actually. So you wanna think, is it a good place to develop? Um, and think about you know what are the cpd opportunities that might be there and certainly that's something you might dig into a little bit at interview as well as career progression if you want to find out about a school the best way to do it is to ask around if there's someone who works in the school hands down that's the best way to do it so that might be asking around um amongst yourselves your cohorts um and your initial teacher education course um or more widely Ofsted gradings give you an idea. I personally don't always find them that useful. I know plenty of outstanding schools that I would never work in, and I know plenty of not outstanding schools that I would jump at to work in. Uh, the school website is useful, but they can potentially be a bit generic, but you might pick things up from there. You could also look at the school's EBAC percentage entry in their languages value added score on the school performance tables. That's a government website. And why is that 
particularly useful well it tells you what stock slt put in languages so if you've got a very very small amount of students currently taking a gcse that might tell you well hang on perhaps the school doesn't particularly support languages so that's a useful in but i would caveat that with saying that that's never the full picture and you may have a school i can think of one at the moment that i know where currently they've got very few year 11s but further down the school they've got you know the vast majority of students studying a language in terms of applications, I'm sure on your teacher training courses, you've been given plenty of advice. I've linked there the Times Education Supplement advice. From me, just a very brief thing, I think, check the quality of your language. It's it's so obvious, but it's so easy for that to be the first thing that just put, gets your CV popped in the bin. Um, make sure it's bespoke, so do your homework on the school. You may start potentially with a template, but it's a really sticky wicket um, if you get a template off a national website. Um, so not only do you maybe not pick the boxes in terms of um, aligned up with the school itself, but if it's a template that the person reading your application has seen before, it's going straight in the no pile. Um, so do your homework and think, yeah, how can you make it bespoke to the school and how do you make yourself stand? What do you bring to the table that other candidates may not be able to bring? And also do your referees know because quite often, and as we approach um, the end of the academic, <laughs> then uh, sometimes turnaround can be quite tight on in, you know the, the time turnaround between adverts going out and deadlines and then call to interview so you might want to give your referee whoever that may be a heads up so that they can expect and perhaps prepare um, a reference for you in advance. You'll notice I've put in brackets so uh, last year this would have just been advice for interviews but I've adapted it and tweaked it so it's very much about online interviews. So do remember yes you're being interviewed but this is also your chance to fact find and get a feel um, for the school. It's, it's really different and it's unprecedented and I guess the interviewer and the interviewee are are a little bit more in the dark than they would be normally. You won't get a chance necessarily to walk around and get a feel for the school physically, but do what you can um, at all junctures of the interview to try and get a feel for the school. And really more importantly than getting an idea of the school, but the people who are interviewing you. So your potential head of department, your colleagues, your line managers, really is interesting. I'd strongly recommend that you check your tech. So the lighting, is your microphone working, is your software, um, what's the school using? Is it going to be Zoom? Is it Microsoft Teams? Combination of all of the above. And really importantly, do have a plan B. Um, so perhaps another device or tablet in the background. Plan some answers to typical questions, but I, my advice would be is that, yeah, you might have some kind of bullet points or some rough ideas, but you want to avoid reading out loud responses, much like um, students in their oral exams. So you want to be speaking from the heart, but you want to be thinking as well um, of what you could prepare in advance. And definitely, definitely, I would have a run through online through the software that you're intending to use. I would also, if I was applying for a job online, I'd be clarifying expectations around, it's very likely, highly likely you'd have to teach a lesson or at least plan some part of a lesson. So I would clarify the expectations. Um, and by that, I mean, is it a live lesson? Should you be talking through a lesson? Do you want the panel to behave as if they're actually students? Or are you going to be talking about what you would teach? Um, certainly, I'm thinking of some interview processes that I've been involved in recently and I was asking the teacher to do a bit of both so they would teach for 15 minutes and then for the remainder the next 15 minutes they would talk me through how the rest of the lesson would pan out and um, if you are clarifying expectations what I would suggest is that if you are getting in touch to ask these questions it's a fine line so you want to get in touch so that you really know and you're prepared what is exactly being asked of you but be aware those emails that you send to get in touch they will feed into a decision making process so if you are saying oh could you resend this or oh i've lost this you, you can inadvertently you know if organizational skills aren't your, your forte that can come across really strongly and i know that that feeds into the interview process much the way in the school that you know you might be invited on a walk of the school and you might go into a room with a few students or you might bump into the mfl department at the photocopier that's part of the interview people will be watching how you interact with colleagues how you interact with students and um, so yeah just be mindful of that that extends in the online world to your interactions around the interview application 
the one big change I would say is that um, you probably want to think more about how you can articulate your thinking behind the planning. It's going to be a slightly false, potentially stilted environment. So how are you ready and have you thought in advance, right, how could I convey what I wanted to get across in this lesson? That's something that's perhaps might be emphasized more than your traditional face-to-face -face interview. And I'd certainly suggest have something ready to share. Um, it may be that you don't use it, um, but it may be that it helps you stand out from others. So it could be a lesson plan, it could be a, a unit plan, and um, the people who interview you won't be able to get a sense of you know what your long-term planning is like just from an online interview. So if there is something that you're impressed and proud of uh, from your teacher training year, then I would strongly suggest you have that to hand. And you could always suggest that you share that, and the worst that can be said is no. So that could be a, a nice illustrative piece of work from your folder of evidence perhaps. What always stands out to me in a candidate interview is their, if they're able to drop in some of their own recent learning. So the ability to show they're a bit reflective, they're not um, stuck and they're not know-it-alls. So they've been looking, they've been involved in wider research or there's a recent article that, you know, certainly a question that I often uh, ensure is in interviews when I'm partaking is, tell me about the last piece of research that you read that's informed your practice. And I think, you know, have something on the tip of your tongue that shows off that you're, that you're informed. And quite a, f a lot of the questions, this next little bit about framing your questions, I, I always think it's definitely good to have a couple of questions um, at the end of an interview if you're asked. Um, um, but it's important to think how you might frame those. And I think how you frame language and how you interact with people are really, really important. I'm fascinated by it. So you might say, oh, in my second placement, I had a terrible mentor. Well, I definitely get a protect two hour meeting slot every week that is going to send alarm bells ringing in any panel's head. So you might frame that uh, better by saying, could you outline the support that's available for NQTs? What does your NQT program look like? Do you foresee adapting your support? Um, let's see a typo there. Do you foresee adapting your NQT support in light of COVID-19? And from their response, then you might have follow-up questions, but the, the first kind of bad example I've given you there, that, that's not going to shine you in a good light at all. Similarly, if you were to say something like, well, I have to do online lessons, I haven't done that before, you might come across as potentially uh, panicked or, you know, a bit in need of support unnecessarily. Simply, you could tweak that and frame it differently. Just ask, how is your school dealing with COVID-19? It could be as important as that. How is online teaching currently organised? You may hear that the school is using something or other, and that worries you because you've not had a chance to do that. So you could very reasonably ask, I haven't used Google Classroom yet. If I were the successful candidate, would it be possible to get training on that? So think of how you frame your questions, because that will that will tell the, the panel a lot about, about you. So question four, for those who have gone through an interview or an online interview, what advice, tips or lessons learned do you have? Can you prefix that, please, with A4 colon? Just to say, it's been lovely that people have actually naturally been contributing while you've been speaking as well. So that's a lovely spirit of um, helping. Thank you. Yes, almost. Uh, you inevitably you will certainly get a question on safeguarding. So the idea there is that you must know who the, the designated person is, designated safeguarding lead. You can't offer confidentiality and you would pass it on to the relevant person. Yeah, safeguarding is coming through a few times. People um, about extracurricular, that's a really nice question to ask as well. Um, some thoughts coming through on researching the school. Having an example to mind of a very good lesson. That's one I myself quite like to ask. Tell me about your best MFL lesson and why. Tell me about your worst and why. And what you've done differently as a result. Great, lots and lots of ideas coming through. So we're going to scoot on to the next stage then. Uh, preparing for the NQT year, what you might be doing this term. So your main task obviously is to meet the course requirements for QTS and plug your knowledge gaps. Um, Helen Myers and uh, Joe Dale signposted you to lots of CPD. They've talked about Tilt Thursdays. Also on slide 20 of this presentation, I've got some more links, but never has there really been a better time to indulge in lots and lots of CPD. So if you know that you've got a gap somewhere, uh, now is the time to be plugging that. Uh, 
this is a big if, if it's possible, link up with your school. Now, ordinarily, and I think of my own NQT year, I was fortunate enough to be appointed before the summer. So I went in for the last three weeks of summer term and that was worth its weight in gold. Um, that luxury isn't always available and certainly uh, very unlikely to be now unless you're staying on in the same school where you might go into school a little bit over the, the coming term, but even that will be very, very limited. So I say a big if, we need to be really careful and, and aware that schools priorities have massively, massively shifted, um, but it may be possible that you get in touch. Um, so I've, I've struck through what the advice I had previously, but you know, otherwise, or when things hopefully return to normal, the idea of visiting the school and meeting the department, observing, teaching classes. And this applies to the digital world as well as face to face, but your first impressions uh, count. So I would I always encourage um, NQTs and trainees, be, be politely proactive. Um, don't be over the top, don't be pushy, don't be nagging, don't be chasing, particularly at this really stressful time for a lot of departments. Um, but equally put yourself out there. Can you show that you're proactive and willing uh, to get involved in support? One thing that might be quite easy to do would be perhaps to source some key documents um, for your school, like their scheme of work, even the school day, knowing what time break times at, how those things might be staggered, when there's extra curricular after school. All of that's available on the school website without you having to pester anyone. Um, you may, depending on how IT is set up, you could indeed access resources. In normal times, I would say timetable, but I, I'm not sure schools are really, really uh, kind of feeling their way in the dark and, uh, on this one at the minute. So I'm not aware of any schools that, that's going to have a, a timetable ready at the minute. We just don't know. September's timetable could look very differently and, and there'll be lots of changes over this term. Uh, I also would previously have advised, unless you are in touch with your school and know the context, the idea of planning lessons in advance, it could be something and um, if you're confident that that could be a useful investment of your time, then by all means do that. But I would be checking you're not misinvesting your time at this stage. Your key contacts would be your head of department. It might be that you uh, know who your mentor might be, but that decision may not be made yet. So again, politely proactive, but don't be pushy because the schools may not have gotten around to allocating your mentor yet. And the same goes for your NQT or your professional mentor who might be overseeing your NQT program and your induction more generally. What I would do is if I did have the contact details of the head of department is I'd ask what I could usefully be doing. Um, so every school's context will be different and I'd perhaps offer support. So if you know a certain resource or um, a lesson on, I just saw something in my inbox today, a teacher done a great lesson on COVID-19 actually. So they were talking about what school looked like before COVID-19, what it looks like now and what it will look like in September. So, you know, there might be a one-off lesson or something cultural or a, a resource or some scheme of work planning you could offer support upon. And so this has changed a little bit as well, but number one piece of advice for, for summer would definitely be to try and have a great summer. Um, Holidays obviously are massively limited and that's changed somewhat with the circumstances, but do try and have a proper disconnect. Um, as I mentioned before, I'd taught for a few years before I did my teacher training year and it was the teacher training year was, you know, one of the most exhausting and challenging years. It was great and I learned loads, but I was properly ready for a disconnect and encourage you to, to look after yourselves. Um, and I'd also say reflect properly on your past year. So try and take a step back and think about, well, what went well, what should I be working on? Uh, what experiences can I take from those contexts? What might be different if I'm changing context? Question five then, in the Zoom chat window, can you set yourself a personal development target now and share it? So you've probably been having um, different reports written by mentors and checked by your tutors at university and often linked to the teaching standards. Um, but what are you working on individually? Behavior and differentiation, pace coming up. I often think differentiation is, is quite a good one because if your focus is differentiation then it means lots and lots of the other building blocks are in place. And so I would just make you aware, think now, thanks everyone for sharing, um, but ask yourself how smart was your target? So lots of one word answers, and obviously time is um, pressured here and we're answering quickly in a chat bar, but when I say reflect, you'll notice I've used the word properly. So 
take a real think because doing AFL or doing differentiation, it, it it's almost meaningless in, in the form that I've just said it. So unless you make it something really specific, is it a particular type of differentiation with a particular type of student at a particular time? Can you measure, you know, so if, if I came back to you next year and said, oh, did you do differentiation? Could you tell me yes or no? Or, or what would be the evidence for that? Is it attainable? Is it something that you can realistic achieve, realistically achieve? Is it relevant to what you're doing? And is it time-based as well? There's, there's a danger sometimes I feel with targets, that if they're not smart, you can end up in a really loose, uh, very jargonized conversation in mentor meetings or with heads of department. Um, so make it really, really specific and measurable, um, attainable, relevant and time-based. A few people mentioned about uh, CPD, and I would suggest that set some time aside for that. One thing I've developed with my team that I work with each week is that we were inundated with all this amazing CPD coming online. And actually we kept sharing and saying, oh yeah, you should go to this webinar or you should download this, that, the other. And actually what we find is we were just so overloaded that it wasn't happening. So now we have a specific, within my team, a specific one hour slot. Well, actually we have two at the minute because um, um, the luxury is there that there's so much CPD available, but for one hour on a Monday and one hour on a Thursday, we have a one hour protected slot where all we're doing is our self-directed CPD. Um, so you might want to do something similar over your summer. I'd say swat up on pedagogy. Um, so you might look at ALL or NSELP or the Language Teacher Toolkit. There's a book that I really rate for that. You might swat up on tech. We've already heard about Tilt Thursdays. That would be a great place to start in terms of attending those webinars and again this was mentioned in terms of what you might do this term but you may not yet have access to school documentation but summer would be useful for that again i would strike through um, the idea of planning your lessons until you have a clear picture of the context you're going to be working in in september and what what planning a lesson even looks like um, because whether that's online or face to face or indeed the likelihood is that it would be both um, could be quite different and what you might do is set aside um, a reminder in your phone just to check in if you do have contact with the HOD, maybe a couple of weeks before the end. So check in and see what the school's up to in terms of their September plans for starting back. And then that gives you a bit of time to, to prep as appropriate. Okay, uh, I think in the beginning of the NQT year, I'm going to up the speed a little bit. I'm conscious of time here. But be aware, I think flexibility is the number one thing you're going to have to be. And everyone's in the same boat on this with, with uh, lockdown and school closures um, or school closures for, for the vast majority of students that we've seen. Uh, so everyone's in the same boat, but it will be a fresh start, even if you're in the same school. Um, the new school year is a real chance to, to start afresh. Um, I think be aware of the primacy and latency effects. So first impressions count and last impressions count. Think of that within your planning. But think of that also in terms of how you interact with people. Think of that in terms of your interview as well. And I'm a really big believer in the power of relationships. So understanding that schools are communities and, and understanding how they work. I admit I was so focused on the classroom that I, I barely set foot outside my classroom uh, in my NQT year and I really wish I'd developed a better sense of how school functions overall. So be aware you've got your MFL department, you'll have a network in terms of other NQTs in your school. The key people, the most important people in the school, you know, receptionists, librarians, canteen staff, reprographics, IT, there's maybe a social scene with people um, for me, it was Friday football and then, and then the pub. Really, really key and important to get involved. Uh, don't be afraid to ask someone what their name is if you've forgotten it, because otherwise you'll end up with that awkward thing with one year down the line, you say hello to someone, but you never know their name. Um, identify as quickly as you can who are your go-to colleagues for questions. So right, when I have a silly question or a question I think is silly, who can I run that by? Um, think of your work-life balance. My the best piece of advice I got on my NQT year was to book in an activity. And for many years, I've played football every Monday, for example. Um, I would remind you to eat your lunch. <laughs> it sounds ridiculous, but make sure you eat your lunch. And uh, do leave your classroom as well. Um, draw lines. So you might decide in advance when will you arrive, leave each day. It's really good to have a kind of line in the sand on that. I think otherwise, you know, there's always something extra that could be done or you could always plan a bit more a lesson. Uh, it may be very advisable not to have work email on your mobile phone, I would suggest. Um, your personal organization. So 
perhaps not my forte, uh, if I'm honest, but, you know, thinking of what's your digital organization like as well. How are you keeping emails? How are you tracking lessons that you're doing? Are they organized in folders so that you can, you know, source things uh, next year when you might need to call on resources? Think of, are you labeling your emails? You Most likely, as you've experienced this year, you'll be getting a lot of email potentially in schools. Uh, so how you deal with that is quite an important one. And extension again of that is your um, your classroom organization, um, where are your resources, where are your glue sticks. All this is probably a, a fair way down the line at the moment in light of uh, COVID-19. Um, but um, I've observed so many lessons where behavior starts to go um, due to really basic, simple organizational things like a teacher asking one student to hand out all the books um, it's just a really, really inefficient way of doing it and dependent on the student it can work or if it's the wrong student then that student has 29 conversations around the room handing in books as well do you have a system for that if it's rows you just pass to the middle and pass to the front and it can be done in 20 seconds or are you spending three minutes collecting in books at the end of lessons uh, so think of the organization and practicing those routines and obviously at the very beginning you want to set out your stall and your expectations that's really important um, I mentioned before point three the primacy effect so you know first impressions count and you want to be really clear and think about well how are you going to convey those expectations so that they're crystal clear and it's really important to follow the school's policies um, I'm of the opinion that anytime you don't follow a school policy you actively undermine your colleagues and there's nothing worse than one teacher letting chewing gum chewing go in their lesson and then you being the teacher that has to deal with the kids it says oh but so and so lets me do that so follow your school policies and the one thing you have in your behavior management toolkit is your seating plan i'd say it's this kind of um tacit you're sitting there because i'm the teacher and i'm in in control so do think about your seating plan and that can be a really useful tool for behavior and choice phone calls as well really really powerful um good to preempt some bad behavior i used to if i foresaw that there's a particular uh, student that after first lesson maybe problematic i would just have a quick phone call to check in and praise uh aforementioned student so that you at least have a rapport with the with those parents so that if down the line there is uh, a behavioral issue that, that arises then that those parents are much more likely to be on side than if you call them cold just to basically relay poor behavior do avoid the being down with the kids trap. So it's not our job to be um, liked and adored by students. And that's a very, very difficult Pandora's box. Once you're too familiar or too down with the students, it can be very difficult to get that back. And there's no problem at all with letting a little bit of your personality out um, over time. That's a, a personal teacher choice that, you, that you'll have and feel you'll, you'll decide what you're most comfortable with. But certainly if you go too lax and too cool from the get go, uh, my experience is, is that, that that will lead to difficulties down the line. And embed, um, embedding target language and your classroom routines, do invest time early to get that stuff right. So I mentioned about books or maybe there's a roll call routine or how you enter and exit your classroom. It may feel laborious to be, you know, okay, that wasn't good enough. We're going to practice that again. Um, but that is time that you'll, uh, that you'll save over the long run. Uh, a couple of tips then. If things do get tough, I'd say be aware that there are seasonal peaks and troughs within the year. So uh, everything's a bit different at the moment, but you know, you'll have the, the kind of impetus of being back to school in September and then you have half term and then things are a bit disjointed around um, December as there are school plays and all that kind of thing. And then you have the exam cycle that starts to kick in and you have some release time in summer. So be aware of those seasonal peaks and troughs understand where your micro and macro support levels are. So who's your go-to person in your corridor in the next room, or is there a teacher in another department that's also an NQT, but then also be aware of support networks more widely like AWL or the MFL Twitterati. Brilliant piece of advice that I was given, set up a thank you box. Um, so that could be for actual hard copy thank yous, or I have one in my emails. So anytime I get a nice email that goes straight into the thank you box, that can be really, um, G, G up if you're in need of a bit of inspiration. 
be aware that your NQT year is really busy um, and it may be that NQTs this year notice it depending on what September looks like you may notice it more not having had less experience I know some people were worried about their amount of um, the timetable that they've taught to date and then the, the jump in September potentially and um, so you will you will no doubt be very busy but it's almost in a, in a different and liberating way I find it was great to have my classroom my rules um, and left to my um, left to work with my students a bit more than on my teacher training year. You'll find over time that you will become more efficient and you become better at prioritizing things and you know inevitably you become more confident and experienced. I would urge that you're always the reflective practitioner so realize that you're never the finished article and critically ask yourself what is it that I can actually control so you might have a really tough lesson or you might then get, you might start externalizing things greatly. Oh, the kids are this and that. And oh, I have to do this because my schema work tells me blah, 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 it's rubbish. So you can quite kick, quickly get into these negative cycles, but always work on the premise of what's within the realms of my control and explore how you can impact things. I would say be aware of, uh, be aware of the staff room. Um, staff rooms are really, useful and cathartic places as well, but there's also the potential for them to be um, potentially quite negative places as well, depending on who you fall in with. So um, yeah, I would, I would suggest just, just be aware of staff room dynamics is really important. And there's a great line from um, Bill Rogers, the behavior guru, he talks about the black dot in a white box. So if you imagine draw a box and then just with the tip of a pen, you do a black dot. And he says that the black dot is poor behavior and the rest is normal good behavior so very often you might have a lesson and you think oh the kids were terrible and in fact you're maybe really over focusing on the negative you're focusing in on that black dot when in fact the vast majority of students have done as you've asked of them and you know completed a lot of work so so try and put things in perspective um i'm going to go very quickly here so beyond your nqt year i'll let you read down these are some of the things that you might get involved with down the line. As I said before, lots of different avenues for progression and exploring your interests. Some common post NQT roles. If I think of my NQT year and beyond, um, I had a responsibility uh, for a key stage uh, a little bit later down the line. Then I mentored another teacher. Uh, you might be responsible for running a trip or supporting a trip. So you could be a trip leader. You may set up an extracurricular club. You may look at the provision for native speakers. Uh, those are perhaps common in QT roles. And it'll be down the line a little bit, but just so that you're aware, AWL provides support at all stages of your career. So there, for example, you can see, should any of you be aspiring head of languages handbook, there's uh, a publication AWL made for that. So how are we doing for time? I'm just going to check my watch a couple of minutes okay super fast then uh, my top tips for mfl learning um do work on behavior but play the long game two names that you need to know for behavior if that's something that you're working on is bill rogers and also tom bennett who write, has written a lot for the tes and is uh, the behaviors are for the government i'd suggest you observe colleagues and where you can really talk about mfl pedagogy um, rather than the behaviour of the students. Uh, try and reframe your discussions after lessons about the actual content of the lesson and what students are being invited to, to think about um, and uh, the activities they're asked to do. Remember that you need to put the language in before you expect it to come out. So don't straight off the bat get students to do writing or speaking if you've not given sufficient comprehensible input. I would suggest having some go-to activities that work for you. So for me, it's the telepathy game. It's the easiest game in the world. Zero prep. I'm thinking of particular sports. They're in my head and students have to guess and they put up their hand and I say it's a good uh, guess, but no one point for Mr. Shanks. And then it goes on to the next students and suddenly you can go through and students have called out 10 or 15 vocabulary items. And that has cost me nothing in terms of preparation. And it's a game that students know and it's a routine they know and it's an effective activity. I touched on organisation, um, but don't underestimate that, particularly in MFL. In MFL, you potentially have dictionaries, vocabulary books, textbooks, pencil cases, starter sheets. You've got audio, you've got speaking activities, you've got changed partner. It can be a very cognitively busy, busy place. So sometimes think of how can you reduce the cognitive noise and really focus in on what's at hand. And the same for activity design. I mentioned before, sometimes routines um, can lead to 
a routine is not being established, for example, how books are collected can lead to poor behaviour. Similarly, an unclear worksheet um, where it's not really clear with or poor instructions from the teacher equally can lead to that. Consider skimming versus depth. Um, rather than skimming over and trying to include 20 different little MFL activities or the ones that can allow you to go into deeper processing. And I mentioned as well, recycling activities and language. Lots and lots of discussions around target language, and I'd suggest you try your best to establish a really good classroom environment for that and embed it would be the word. And also unpick it. So just by you speaking 95% in the target language doesn't mean it's having any impact and indeed could be having a negative impact upon students if they're not understanding it. So understanding that target language is from teacher to student, it's from student to teacher, and it's also from student to student, and that it's only useful if it's comprehensible. I'd say teach phonics and teach listening rather than just testing it. And what's quite in vogue at the minute, but with very good reason, is a lot around cognitive science. So Ebbinghouse, you may already have seen the forgetting curve and this idea that we need to revisit things over time. So when your students don't know the numbers one to 100 in French, don't get angry at them. That's probably because they were taught them in one lesson in year seven, and you expect them to know that in year 11 without having taught them again. So the question is that you do again. Um, CI stands for comprehensible inputs what's going in needs to be understood and space repetition in relieving and retrieval practice. The Learning Scientists is a really good website, Learning Scientists, that has a nice concise summary of principles of cognitive science um, that are applicable for the classroom. I'd say definitely use tech but be pragmatic about it. Is there a benefit to using this technological tool? And engage with MFL Twitter Addy and MFL Chat. Okay, uh, I did have, oops, I've just stopped sharing my screen. And do you do go, I mean, I didn't, I chatted on at the beginning for about 10 minutes. So you have got time, David, if you've got Okay, time. I'll talk for another five five minutes. I will do this yeah. last I mean, slide. And then as you've, you've already mentioned to people, feel free, um, should you need to skip on words, but I'll just finish on this last slide and then sample some um, CPD. And then after that, we will, I'll take some Q&A for those who want to remain behind. So I'll just be here. So just by way of summary, some top tips in general. Don't forget the why. Why are we doing this? And you need to be the walking, talking, the epitome of why we learn languages to your students. So don't assume that students have the same enthusiasm. You'll be a language graduate and um, bilingual, trilingual. You'll have benefited from languages and it will be self-evident why it's good it's good and important to learn languages many of your students may not come from that same place so your job is to try and convey that message remember that no teacher has ever the finished article be the reflective practitioner um, draw the lines a really good friend and colleague once said to me and i found it really reassuring he'd find a, a senior leader's um, pile of geography books in the school i worked in and they hadn't been marked and this was ironic because, you know, this member of uh, SLT was in charge of uh, the marking policy. But just being aware that there's not a teacher in the school who could potentially do more. And it's about realizing, do you know what? I'm finished for today. Draw a line under it. OK, I think that's really important. We've talked a lot about establishing your support networks and uh, work life balance. Work on your behavior toolkit, but don't beat yourself up. For, um, poor behavior is ultimately a choice, but there's a lot that is within your realm of control in terms of student behavior. Don't lose sight of your pedagogy. Don't get distracted by, oh, that's a that's a great app or that's a particular activity. How can I crowbar that into my lesson? Think what they want the students to learn in terms of language and how can I stepwise get them there? I fully encourage creativity, but a really wise piece of advice that came up in the chat window earlier was don't reinvent the wheel. I'd say use PowerPoint less, use fewer slides. You are the number one resource. Can you do a listening activity where you are the voice and you're reading aloud and you don't need a slide to prepare for it? Number nine, be an active member of your professional community and fly the languages flag. That is an easy next step by joining AWL. If you're not a member already, um, join up. And those who are members, do spread the word to your uh, soon to be NQT colleagues. And remember that teaching is the best job in the world. And I refer you again to those couple of really nice clips. So that's it in terms of my NQT. Um, preparing for your NQT year. I'll take questions shortly, but just to sign post you, Helen has already talked about, it says past events 87. That gives you an idea of how active uh, 
Helen and uh, many other people in AWL and AWL London in particular have been in terms of supporting the languages community. My gem that I found just recently is Steve Smith. He has a YouTube playlist. Uh, you see it goes up to 28 little videos. And in my estimation, these are really nice. You can watch them any time, but they're perfectly sized. They're about 15 to 20 minutes long and they're very good quality and they cover many, many different aspects of MFL teaching. So you can see one there just by way of example, one on writing, one on um, teaching in the target language, one on the PPP model. So present, practice and produce on paying attention, assessment, sentence builders, lots and lots there. Other ways to keep learning is through Linguascope, who have a really nice selection of upcoming webinars that you can go through that top link and they're kindly offering recordings of their previous webinars as well through the second link. And I also pass on to potential of a discount on the book Independent Thinking, I should say, on MFL. That's Krista Hale, who works uh, for the AWL Central Office. So that's a book that she's written on MFL and you have a discount code there. <coughs> Final last little plug, a reminder that you can get 10% off AWL membership with the code webinar10. And we've got that message so far, hopefully. And that's it from me. Um, any questions and answers? I have collated on the next slide a few of those um, that I compiled together that weren't answered in the presentation. So I, I will skip onto those, but I'm happy to take any immediate questions that come up in the chat bar. So Helen, have you noticed anything that's come up that might be, be honest, what's well, been, between us? <laughs> yes, what's been great is often when people have asked a question, people within the group have then answered it um, and given ideas. So for example, ideas about being um, a form teacher, that's where um, Annalise Gordon has given a link. Um, tips on managing workload for next year, I think really you covered, didn't you, in the last the last slide there? Um, but there's obviously a nervousness from going from 20% to an 80% teaching timetable. Um, and then a third question about when would you recommend starting a master's? So there's been a mixed input from teachers about doing it. So those were ones which I think had um, I noticed particularly. Mm. I think the master's is a good one. Someone mentioned that um, in a question when they signed up as well. Um, I think it really varies according to the person. My, my gut reaction is, is that if you're at the stage of in your career as an NQT, then you're probably still honing your craft and probably owe it to your students to be fully focused on that. I waited for about five years until I, I did mine. Um, I looked at a number of different um, master's courses and I found that a few of them were a bit too generic for me personally and that they were looking um, maybe about um, reflection or development and um, teaching and learning in general. So I waited and I, I found a course it happened to be through uh, King's College and this allowed me just to basically pick different modules that were quite disparate. So I did something on technology and MFL and then something on how you measure school performance and the philosophy behind that and the kind of different approaches. Um, so I would be a little bit I wouldn't say don't do a master's in your first year at all because you might, uh, it depends on you as a person, you might take it in your stride. But my, my gut reaction would be to, to perhaps wait a little bit until you're bedded in at your school. And sorry, Helen, you said a couple of other um, questions. Well, yeah. actually, Josh has just asked a question. If you had one big tip for September, what would it be? <laughs> one big tip. I would say book in um, a regular weekly event. So that was whether it's football or an outing to a restaurant with someone outside of school. I think that's really, really important. So well-being, NQT is a busy year and you'll be finding your feet. And it, I mean, the one thing I've, a colleague of mine told me about that and I was always in awe of him. Oh, how do you manage to do that? He's at football and at the cinema and all kinds of things. And he, he just did it in advance. And then when you know that it's in advance, you, you just make time and you, you draw those lines a lot better. Whereas if you don't have something in the diary, it's a really slippery slope just to stay longer in school, to plan a lesson more, to mark more books. So that, that would be my personal number one. And well, teacher well-being is incredibly important. Mm -hmm. I think you've got, some you've got some other questions, haven't you, which people put beforehand. Do you want to go over those now? Yeah, I think uh, so. The these um 
So I think we've covered already, people are a bit concerned that, you know, their school experience is being cut short. I would just re-emphasize the point on, on flexibility um, and being really aware that everyone is in the same boat. So I think, you know, from the schools that I work with that, you know, things are going very, very slowly and stepwise and, you know, come September, we don't know quite what it looks like, but getting their teachers and staff up to speed and working in potentially new ways is is very much high on their priority list as well. So I wouldn't, it's understandable people are concerned, but I think a lot of people, no matter how experienced they are, are learning a lot at the minute. So we're all in the same boat. And hopefully, as you see through, you know, AWL, this webinar, the Tilt Thursdays, there's a really good um, kind of community spirit, particularly amongst uh, MFL teachers, I would say. So lean on the support of other MFL colleagues. Uh, some people asked about getting involved in extracurricular. I'd say definitely. Um, again, depends on you. Don't spread yourself too thin, but identify something that you'd be interested in. Uh, one of the best things I did for teaching um, a really tough group that I had, they were year nine and they were probably boys. And just by coincidence, they were looking for a male teacher to go on the Holland football trip. So nothing related to languages at all, but I find that worth its weight in gold when I came back and started to teach some of those students again, because I'd, I'd had a chance to see them in a context in which they were thriving. Um, I was able to draw upon that. So do get involved in extracurricular. Somebody had asked a very specific question about uh, your induction and kind of accumulate aggregating your experience. So um, the question was, can you complete an NQT or in a part-time role? And you absolutely can, but in terms of your induction, it needs to last the full-time equivalent of one academic year. So if you were working uh, 0 0.5 um, per week, then that would equate to a two-year induction. And a couple of questions came up about interacting with parents and carers, because that may be something that up until now, you've not yet had much of a chance for. And um, my overarching, and I'd be interested to hear from you, Helen, my over arching kind of um, experience of interacting with parents is that it's been really good and positive <laughs> and I know beforehand I was worried oh what if I get a difficult parent and occasionally there's been one or two but really really minority and in my experience you know parents absolutely parents and carers want the absolute best for their for their students and the, the best thing you can do is just just sit in on a phone call or speak to someone and um, you know Perhaps you look at some communications or an email um, adhering with GDPR now, of course, but I, I recall sitting with my head of department who was phoning home um, and I overheard the conversation and I just used that as a template then for my subsequent phone calls and I, I found it really reassuring. Um, anything to add on that, Helen? Yes, I agree. And I think it's, it's, but it's definitely something where to learn from people who've already been doing it first. Yeah. I very definitely would say, I mean, some schools may have a policy of actually you, you don't ever communicate um, yeah. immediately because of the importance of knowing if there's a background issue that you don't know about. So some schools actually ask you to channel things through a pastoral yeah. person. So set, to find out what the policy is in your school. But your advice, David, of sitting in and listening and almost, you know, writing down the phrases that you see that people use, just as you would with when you're learning how to teach. Yeah. So I think that's very good advice, yeah. And the last little thing was about decorating your classroom. I think it's great. It's a blank blank canvas. Do, do with it what you, what you want. Inject a bit of your personality. Um, I always quite liked having certain functional displays, so for key phrases or key conjunctions or key tenants information. But then the one thing that you need to remember to do is don't let those become a crutch. Um, so at some point you need to remove that scaffolding or um, I had the numbers one to a hundred um, along the back wall so that I knew if students were recalling the numbers and they were facing forward then they were recalling it from memory and not just reading aloud um, from a classroom display. I think classroom display as well is a couple of things I've seen um, nicely done, uh, a chance to kind of explore cultural aspects. So you know pictures of last year's trip abroad is a good one and um, i've seen a nice map of the mfl department where you have perhaps a map of the world and then a little fact um a little info box in the string um that is pinned on the country of origin of that person or the languages that that person speaks so those are a couple of things and another thing yeah put, put students work up on walls as well that can act as a as a kind of showcase and add an extra incentive for students to put their best efforts in 
that's great. Um, other questions, to be honest, there were quite a few questions which were general ones about what do you think about a particular technique or how should we teach listening or reading? And I think that's something where um, you've given references where we can find out about um, mm -hmm. methodology, about pedagogy. Really, the purpose of this webinar was really meant to be in your situation now, anticipating your NQT year, what are the issues for you? Um, and certainly if you're interested in discussing wider than that, then really it is following the links that David's given, getting involved in the discussions that there are around. And certainly with the AWL, we have, as well as languages today, we also have access to journals where people are discussing things. And probably you've, you've come across that um, in, your, in your studies. Is that fair, David, rather than putting you on the spot now about everything? <laughs> no, de definitely I agree. And I think you know, there, there's there's a lot out there, and you know, as Dylan Williams says, every, everything works somewhere, nothing works everywhere, and that's that's something I always adhere to. That there's there's no panacea, and we can learn a lot from lots of very contexts. So that would be my my quote. Yeah, that's great. Um, I've I've kept a note of the questions. I'll be doing an email to everybody so you've got a link to all of this and if there are questions there where I feel that we we've missed them or we could um, give some answers we can keep in touch with you and you keep in touch with us that's fine you've got our, our details so what I'd really like to do now if this is all right is if people if you stop sharing your screen then David if people would like to come on line open your open your videos if you can your webcams um, open your audio uh, David is an incredibly modest person who'd be very embarrassed about this, but I'd really like us now to <laughs> give a real round of applause to David. Um, we said right at the beginning that people we knew couldn't necessarily stay for the whole time. We've had an enormous number of here. So if you'd all like to start now, and if you'd like as well, even to say thank you, that would be great. So thank you ever so much. Really, really good. Thank you. And the people in the YouTube group as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Each, you. each group. So Thank you. smile now. Here's the first one. So if you keep keep looking happy, please. <laughs> <laughs> as I take pictures. Here's the second, Thank you. second screen. I can see that Jared's right there at the top. And Eleanor, I'm about to take a picture of you. Here goes. There we go. Thank you. Thank you. Lovely. And that's Eleanor there. And the third one. Here we go. Take a picture Why of you as well. That's great. So I've gone, gone through everybody just to, we've got a few pictures. So amazing, David. Thank you ever so much indeed. And we're really, I'm just so, so pleased that you're part of AWL. Obviously, you've been flying, you've also given us so many tips and yeah. ideas. Lovely. I wish you all the very, very best um, in your onward teaching That's careers and you soon at AWL events. And stay safe and stay well. And thanks again to Helen and to Joe for hosting. Great job. So I'll stop the recording now. Oh, okay. Yeah, as you said, oh, how did you feel when?